Um, so what I'm presenting uh, today is, is, uh, is some uh, joint research I've been doing over the last uh, now six years with uh, United Way Toronto. Um, and uh, the project, the bigger project really is not a health project. Uh, uh, the bigger project is now looking at what are the, the social implications of precarious employment, in particular on the welfare of, 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 of uh, families and uh, the welfare of communities. And so the health stuff that I'm going to tease out today is sort of a, a bit of a, a, a small part of the study, uh, but I think it's, uh, it's an interesting part. Uh, and I'm going to try and end by trying uh, to, to build a link between what I think is a transmission mechanism from precarious employment to health, and I think it is largely through the family um, and through the community. That part, I have to be frank, is a lot more speculative, but I think it potentially is, uh, it, is a lot more interesting. And it moves us away, I think, from a, from a, uh, a model of, precarious employment affects health because you're exposed, exposed to toxins and things like that or, or poor working conditions. So it takes it out of the workplace and it puts it into the community, which I think is really quite uh, interesting. So there are really three questions that I want to try and address. And the first one is really a measurement question. Uh, that is, how do we measure uh, the level of precarious employment? And I think a lot of people think, well, that's kind of a panic question. Why would you be answering that, asking that? Because we, are, we know exactly what's going on in the economy. There's actually quite a debate about whether our labor market is becoming more precarious. Um, and there's certainly data that points to the direction that, it's, that in general, employment's not becoming more precarious. So uh, the nice thing about our data set is that we have multiple indicators of a, a person's em employment relationship. And I can actually compare the form of the employment relationship, so that's whether they're part-time, full-time, self-employed, contract, which is the kind of data that Stats Canada collects, with more detailed data about do you have benefits? Do you expect your hours to change? Uh, can you raise your hand if uh, there's a health and safety problem at work? Uh, these sorts of things, which are probably much better in indicators of insecurity than the form. And so we can, we can match these two. And uh, what I'm going to kind of conclude with is that the form of the employment is a very crude measure of, uh, of, of precarious employment. And therefore, those folks who are using the form of the employment, which in some ways hasn't really changed all that much in the last 20 years, um, are actually, it's, it's misleading information um, that really doesn't capture, I think, what's actually going on in the economy. The second thing is we want to ask is, what, why does it matter how we measure uh, precarious employment? And here's where the health stuff is going to come in. So I'm going to show that if, that if you use the wrong measure, you actually don't get the results out that we sort of anticipate you should get or would predict to get. Uh, but if you use a, a more detailed measure of precarious employment the way we've developed in our study, um, then you get findings I think are a little more interesting. And then the last thing I'm going to talk about is how can we use that data now to begin to understand a little bit what exactly are the links between precarious employment and health? What should the policy uh, responses be uh, given the data that we, that we have? So as I said, this is part of a, a larger study, and we've released a, a couple of reports. They're both available at our, at our website, uh, www.pepso. PEPSO.ca. Uh, the first one we released in, in 2000 and, uh, uh, 2014, <coughs> uh, 2013, I guess, based on data in, in, uh, we collected in 2011. And then in the, in, in the spring of 2015, we released the second one, the precarity penalty, based on data we collected in uh, 2014. And I said this is joint work with uh, United Way uh, here in, in Toronto and a number of other community groups. So what, what exactly is the study? What data do we have to work with? Um, the data was collected in two waves. Uh, we collected one wave in 2011, one wave in, in 2014. Um, and in each wave, there were just over 4,000 individuals. So we have uh, just over 8,000 individuals um, in the sample. Data was collected by Leger Marketing. So it was a phone survey. We provided the survey, uh, and, and they did uh, the, the, the data collection. Interview was about uh, 20 minutes in each case. In both the surveys, the number of the questions were identical. Uh, in 2014, we made some changes based on what we learned uh, in 2011. Uh, we've pooled the data only because with, with a larger database, uh, you can just get a, a clearer picture of what's uh, going on. Uh, who did we uh, interview? Uh, we interviewed workers who were 25 to 65 because we really wanted to learn a little bit about the family and community. And so we didn't really want to uh, spend our, our limited resources, say, inter uh, interviewing uh, young people, students who have always been in precarious employment. I think that's a whole different set of issues that they're facing in terms of their, of their employment situation. Likewise, uh, older people who now are going back in the labor market, maybe because they're their pensions are, are insufficient or just because they want to work longer and they remain healthy. Again, we thought that was a different part of the labor market. We just wanted to focus on those folks who 
uh, were sort of in the core of their of their lives in terms of their work lives, but also having families and participating in their in their communities. And they had to be employed. So uh, in the last month, in some form of employment. So we've sort of dropped out those who who, who don't work uh, are un, are unable to work. Um, the, the sample, it's a representative of the Hamilton and GTA. Uh, it's representative by age and by sex based on the 2006 uh, census. Uh, and as well, uh, we, did about, we did 111 interviews with workers in precarious employment to, to help us understand what the numbers are. Because some of you heard this before, I think sometimes the numbers can be misleading. Uh, and so uh, sometimes talking to people gives you a much deeper understanding of what's going on than just, uh, than just the numbers. But today I'm just really going to report things on the numbers. Okay, so, so the questions are, um, are we moving from the employment model of the post uh, the post-war era. I think of these as the 1970s kind of jobs. The standard employment relationship, uh, one employer, full-time, lifetime, uh, benefits, decent wage, often, uh, often unionized. Are we moving from that kind of a model, the kind of jobs you would have uh, if you worked for the Ford Motor Company in Windsor or Oakville or you'd worked for Stelco in Hamilton uh, or you were lucky enough to become a professor like me uh, back in the 70s. Uh, these are the kinds of jobs you have. Are we moving to a different model of employment, which is more precarious, more project-based, short-term, uh, multiple employers, uh, less of a long-term uh, uh, commitment? Um, and you know, you might think, well, th that question has been answered. You look at the media; the media undoubtedly thinks we're here and not and not here. Uh, but it, I think it's not quite that simple, and we need to have a deeper understanding of exactly how uh, labor markets uh, have have changed. And finally, you're going to look at whether uh, there's any link between precarious employment and uh, poor health uh, outcomes. Okay, so there certainly is a substantial body of research uh, over the last 15 to 20 years, all of it pointing in the direction that we are moving to a different kind of labor market, that we are moving away from uh, one in which the, the standard employment relationship is, is, is dominant um, and to something different. And when you're trying to understand what's going on with families and communities, this is quite important because that standard employment relationship, that kind of 70s jobs, the kind of job, Frank, that my dad had, uh, created a, a framework around which family and community uh, operated. If you lived in Windsor, uh, you knew that those kind of full-time auto jobs, uh, which dominated the city, shaped a whole lot of activities in the community, and uh, not just what was going on at work. So certainly Capelli, uh, based on US data in 99, started saying, well, look, at things are changing in the United States. Work is less secure. Um, uh, workers are more exposed to, to, to the market, to market forces. And let me just read, um, uh, 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 re read one of his quotes uh, from Capelli. The market's logic quickly became dominant, pushing out of its way the behavior principles of reciprocity and long-term commitment that underline the more traditional employment contract. So the sense that the relationship between employer and employee had become fractured um, and that's why we called our first book uh, Working uh, Without Commitments. That kind of long-term, lifetime relationship was, was eroding. Uh, Jacob Hacker, uh, uh, in 2006, again, uh, started writing about the great uh, risk shift and how increasingly in the United States, uh, it, it was workers who were being forced to, to deal with the, with the uncertainties of, 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 a, of a market economy, of a, of a capitalist economy, uh, and this was creating different kinds of conditions. By 2011, standing in Britain is talking about the emergence of a new class, the precariats, uh, who, were, who were a group of, of, of people who didn't have either the kind of the, the, the state benefits of unemployment insurance and, un, and, and pensions, et cetera, because of their employment relationship, but also didn't have the employment security based on a long-term commitment to an employer. I think some of the more interesting work now is, is by David Wheel, uh, this, this notion of, of, a, of a fissured workplace. I think Wheel really speaks to the dilemma of measuring uh, precarious employment because he, he starts talking about people who are in forms of the employment relationship, which we might consider to be secure, but in fact are very different from those same forms uh, 20 years ago. And again, let me just read from uh, his, his recent book, uh, The Fissured uh, Workplace. Uh, fissured employment represents both a form of employment, for example, temporary agency employment, independent contracting, and a relationship between different business enterprises, subcontracting, franchising. It reflects not only who does the work, but also the structure of contracts and the relative power between those enterprises that contract and for and those enterprises that are contracted to do the work. Though workers in those subordinate businesses may be classified as employed on a standard, full-time basis, the relationship between lead firms and those where these workers are employed may be fissured and therefore likely to have the characteristics of precarious employment. 
So I think the whole point, today you can say you're in a permanent full-time job. That's very different than 20 years ago. In fact, that job may be, may be quite, uh, quite precarious. So that's sort of the evidence in four, in favor of that we've had a change. But there's also arguments that things haven't changed. And Dugan, out, out, of, out of Britain, has sort of said, this is all a bit of a conspiracy, that in fact the labor market hasn't changed very much. If you look at tenure, uh, long-term tenure and whatnot, the data just doesn't support that people are uh, increasingly in, in, in short-term uh, jobs. Philip Cross, of course, the Canadian, uh, has also taken this issue on, have taken us on, uh, and argued that, look, at the, the labor market really hasn't changed that much in 20 or 25 years. And so it's a bit of a fiction uh, that, that the, the, the employment relationships have become more, uh, more precarious. So there's the two sides. And of course, what's fantastic now, Ken, we have dueling banks. We have two banks on opposite sides of, the, of this issue. We've got a Benjamin Tall from the CIBC, uh, who has a, a measure of, uh, of Canadian Employment Quality Index. The measure of employment quality is now at a record low. And so he talks about, you know, there's not a, a permanent jobs, permanent jobs that do exist, the wages are low, et cetera. And of course, the TD Bank, I guess, for looking for market share, they, they've got exactly the opposite. Their preca uh, precarious employment index came out in 2015. And basically saying, look, 85% of Canadian employees are permanently employed. Right? That's still the case. It has been the case uh, for, for nearly two decades. And, and that's, not, that's not inaccurate. If you go to Stats Canada, that's basically what, what, you, what you find. Um, so what's actually going on? How can we understand these very different perspectives? Uh, so this is the data. This is basically the Stats Canada data. And, and this is really, if you believe in increasing precarious employment, this is, this is troubling data. It's just not really showing that. What it's showing is that probably in the, in the last decade of, 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 of the last century, uh, there, ha there was an upward trend from somewhere around 13 to 14 percent in precarious employment based on the form of the employment. Are you in temporary employment? Are you self-employed without employees? Um, and it really hasn't changed very much in the last 15 years. Uh, so, that, so the form of the employment doesn't give you evidence that things are continuing to, to deteriorate uh, a, as you might think. And really, that's, it's that data that our project has tried to take on. So the question is, how well does the employment relationship, the form of the employment relationship, estimate the characteristics of the employment relationship? So what we did is we developed an index. We call this the Employment Precarity Index. We took 10 questions from our survey, uh, and each of those questions has equal weight in the index. And basically, the higher you score on the index, uh, the more precarious you are. What's critical is we didn't put income into our measure. Obviously, if you're poorly paid, then you could argue that you're, you're precarious. But what we wanted to try and make a distinction was between precarity and poverty as two very different things. And in particular, what we wanted to be able to tease out is that a lot of folks who are not low income are still going to score very highly on this index. Some of them may be in this room. Many of them are employed by my university uh, in, in the economy in general, right? So you can be relatively, I assume you're relatively well paid here, you can be relatively well paid but still very precarious. And we wanted to be able to distinguish between those two things. And both of our reports make a large uh, uh, effort to look at uh, some of those, those differences. So what we did is we took our index and we basically divided our sample into four uh, bins, uh, from secure employment to precarious employment. Each of those bins represents about one quarter of our sample, represents approximately 25%. And these are the scores on the index for those four bins. So you can see those people who are in secure uh, employment, they scored one out of 100. On our, they basically answered no to every one of those questions. One or two of them may have answered yes to get a little bit. And then there's a very steady progression. By the time we get to our precarious group, which is about 25% of the sample, they scored 53 out of 100. How do you define the four groups? Where, what's the size of precarious we, we, we simply said, let's divide it into four equal bids. Oh, it's uh, not based on the score? The just a number. So we have 8,000, we want 2,000 basically in each bid. Uh, and part of the thinking was that all the other measures suggest that probably about a quarter of the workforce is precarious. So what we wanted to know is, is, is our quarter, does it look like the quarter you'd get from Stats Canada, right? Because Stats Canada, if you look at uh, temporary employment, contract employment, own account self-employment, you get about just over 22 or 23 percent. But certainly the, the division lines are, arbit are arbitrary. And it's because we have a continuous measure of precarity, right? But we needed to have some way of saying who's precarious and who's not. Yeah. 
Yeah, we, we, we spend a lot of time thinking of four words that, that describe the continuum. It's much harder than numbers. Um, so secure is the most secure. Stable is not so bad. Vulnerable is not as bad as precarious. Precarious is, is, is the most insecure. But the, the labels are sort of are, are clearly arbitrary. Yeah. And just to follow up, then, did you check on the scores and the situations in that label of stable? Do you think these would reflect stable? And how do you see items that are giving you that score? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, I, think, I think they're, they're reasonable. Yeah. I mean, it's not anything. So the division of the four is based on the percentile, like 25 percentile, and from the, the that's right. That's right. And the exactly. Measuring the that's right. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Okay. So that's so that's the measure we've got, and that's how we're going to define preca precarious employment as the 25 percent of our sample who scored the highest on the index. Okay. So. Um, this looks, uh, spent just a little bit of time, not a lot, because I want to kind of skip through this. This looks at, uh, because it's International Women's Day, it's appropriate to look at this. What is, what's the male-female uh, division between form versus, versus, versus our index? So I, can, I think not surprising here, this looks at the form of the employment relationship. This is the data you get from Stats Canada. Uh, men are, are marginally more likely to be in full-time employment than, than women. Women marginally more likely to be in part-time employment uh, than men. Uh, and about an equal number of, of men and women are now in temporary contract, own account, uh, self-employment. I think reflecting what's we've gone on in, in, in the larger economy, the decline of manufacturing in, in, in Canada, in Ontario, uh, and I think uh, you know women's uh, uh, movement, in, particularly into own account self-employment in, in, in large numbers. Um, this uh, I'm going to skip this one just because I'm not sure. So this is this is our uh, our four our bins using the employment security index again from secure to, to precarious. And again here this you know I'm perhaps a, a bit of a surprise. Uh, women now are more likely to be in that top quartile, uh, the, the the secure quartile. And I think this really does reflect uh, the the hit that men have taken over the last uh, decade. Uh, in terms of their privileges have been eroded because places like Stelco used to employ 13,000 now have uh, 500. Uh, so th a lot of those jobs have disappeared and, and men have not moved into other kind of privileged secure positions. Whereas for women, I think they have been relatively successful as a result of trade unionism and struggle over the last uh, 20 years to actually uh, to have a, 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 a more secure employment. Uh, down here in the precarious, we actually see men being marginally more likely than women to be um, uh, in, in, in precarious employment. I think this, re this reflects to a large extent the men who were jettisoned from those uh, standard employment relationships uh, in, in 2008, et cetera, and now are, are, are forced into uh, a work that is, is, is much less secure. Okay. So what is the correlation between the form of the employment relationship, which you get from Stats Canada, and the characteristics of, of employment, which you get from our, our survey? Uh, and I'm going to skip the income part because I think that's uh, that's not really where we want to focus. Oops, did I do this wrong? Did I skip too many? Here's my one. This one. Okay, so this is, in, in many ways, I think this is probably the most important chart of the talk, and it really, I think, exposes why there can be the debate I talked about uh, early on. Okay, so along here, We've got our, our four bins based on the Employment Precarity Index. So this is the 25% of people who scored the highest on our index. And down here, we've got the three bins that you would get from Stats Canada. These are people who are in permanent full-time employment based on Stats Canada. These people are in permanent part-time employment. And these are our, our, our Stats Canada Precarious. So these are temp temporary workers, contract workers, own account uh, uh, self-employed from, from Stats Canada. And so what you can see is that in the secure and the stable bins, there's a, there's a, pretty, there's a very strong correlation between everybody who's in our secure bin uh, also told us in our survey, I'm in a permanent full-time job. Right? So, that's, so everyone said that that, that was the case. So, so there's a correlation. And even here on the stable, it's, it's pretty close. 96% of our stable 25% uh, also told us they're in permanent full-time employment. So at the top of the pile, uh, the, the correlations are quite strong. It's when you get down here that it becomes a little bit messier. <coughs> so of our precarious group, only 60% would also have been precarious using Stats Canada data. The other 40% are something else. 
told us they were in permanent part-time employment. And perhaps the most surprising, 24%, a quarter, one in four of our people who are in precarious employment would have told us they're in permanent full-time employment on our survey. And that's presumably on, uh, on, on the Stats Canada, that's what they would, they would say. And so if you use the Stats Canada categories to measure precarity, um, you're going to miss a lot of people who are in these bins but also should be in, in, in precarious employment. Plus, a lot of the people who you're going to say in precarious employment are actually in one of these other bins. They're not in this precarious employment. So, so the, 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 the correlation is, is really quite poor at the bottom. And, and I think part explains why sometimes when you see studies that use the Stats Canada form of the employment relationship, the health outcomes are confusing. They're not, they're not exactly what you expect. And I think that's because these ca categories don't really reflect what's going on at the workplace. And I would suggest more they explaining less and less of what's going on at the workplace because of what David Wheel is talking about. That a lot of the people who in Stats Canada are in this bin are now in these fissured workplaces. And, and they don't have the kind of security even though they, they look to be um, in, in, in permanent employment. The other thing that's interesting, and there's some data that's been coming out of Scandinavia, is that workers actually are not so clear what their, what their form of the employment relationship is. And a lot of people who tell us that they have, yeah, I have a permanent full-time job, they're actually contract workers. Uh, so, so, so they're confused. And the, the, the one study I've, I've seen suggests that perhaps as many as, as, as half of the people who, uh, who should be in this bin um, are actually saying uh, they're, they have, they have full-time, permanent full-time employment. So in fact, this, this precarious bin here, it could be actually 50 to 75% larger uh, than, it, than, is, than is reported simply because workers do not understand what their form of the employment is. And they, over, they overestimate. They think they're more secure than they actually are, which I think is a kind of su a surprising result. Okay, so um, let's skip these ones and let's go here to what we really want to sit and talk about. So what is the association between the form of the employment relationship the characteristics of the employment relationship and health outcomes. Can we use these two different measures to begin assessing what's going on with health? So this is a, just a simple uh, a regression analysis where we use the form of the employment relationship, so the three stats Canada categories, um, and we control for age, sex, race, and education. Um, and this is the standard uh, stats Canada question on general health, uh, and, and this, this is people who <coughs> report their health is less than less than very good on that, so we divide it into a binary uh, variable. And what you can see is that there's not a big difference. And more, those people in precarious employment, if anything, are reporting better health than those people in permanent employment. Some of us in permanent employment understand that intimately why that's the case. Um, uh, but it's, it's, it's not the direction one ha would have anticipated. One would have anticipated that precarious employment comes with all kinds of, uh, of stress and, 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 and poor working conditions and it should be in the opposite direction. So you actually don't get what you, what you expect, and none of these results are, are significant. So they're, they're just a wash in terms of the data. If we use the precarity index, so now we've got our four categories from our study, from the precar employment precarity index. So now these are the 25% of the people who score the highest on our index. Now you're getting what you would anticipate. You're getting a, a continuous increase in the number of people saying their health is less than very good uh, by, by uh, by category, so now the people in precarious employment are about 45% more likely to say their health is less than very good than those people who are in, are in secure employment. I think a lot of us would think that seems to make more sense than, than the previous uh, diagram. Uh, mental health, again, we get this kind of confounding result. Mental health using the Stats Canada data, you actually find that now those in precarious employment actually have better mental health. They're less likely to report um, uh, their health is less than very good, uh, and it's, it is uh, somewhat, uh, somewhat significant. Right, so, you know, what exactly is going on? Well, clearly a lot of people who are in precarious using the Stats Canada data, uh, these are folks who maybe they're choosing to be in precarious employment, they like the flexibility, uh, et cetera, et cetera, the kind of things that we talked about in our, in our, in our book, uh, Working Without uh, uh, Commitments. But again, it's not the result that one might have anticipated. Now, if you flip around and if you use our index instead in the four bins, you see, uh, again, I think what, what most people would, would predict, that as you move into more precarious employment, uh, away from secure employment, the odds of having mental health uh, less than very good uh, increase uh, quite uh, dramatically. So at least to me, this is, this is pretty clear evidence that we should really not be using form of the employment relationship 
for, for these kind of health questions, something else. And ours is one way, but there are several other uh, indexes out there that I think do a much better job of, uh, uh, of defining who's precarious and who's not. Okay, so the, 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 the other question is, well, is it actually the precarious employment that's driving this, or is, it, is this just an income? Is this a poverty effect? Right, because we, we, I think we do know that poverty has, uh, has an impact on health. So here we did exactly the same uh, regressions, uh, but we, now we just added in a, a, a variable for uh, different levels of, uh, of individual income, uh, less than 40, 40 to 80, and, and more than 80,000. Uh, and again, we've, here we've, we're using our uh, employment precarity index categories from secure to precarious. And what do we find? Well, we find certainly the effect of precarious employment is dampened quite significantly here, and poverty really does matter. So there is, there's a very steep gradient as you move from 40, less than 40,000 to more than 80,000. Uh, the chances of reporting your health is less than very good uh, go down quite dramatically. Uh, but there's still a small effect for precarious employment in terms of general health. So it doesn't completely disappear, but it's, it's, it's only about a third of what it was uh, when you don't add income into the analysis. With mental health, a bit of a different story. Again, poverty is very important, so as you move over 80,000, the incidence of having uh, uh, less than very good mental health probably falls by half, uh, but now precarious employment remains a pretty significant factor, uh, and <coughs> the, these folks are still, even after correcting for income, uh, are 50% more likely to have uh, uh, less than very good mental health compared to those who are in, uh, in, in secure employment. So I think you, we can begin to see that poverty and precarity uh, have independent effects. They affect general health a little bit differently than mental health, but there still seems to be something going on. The insecurity associated with precarious employment, even after correcting for different income levels and poverty, uh, is having some kind uh, of an effect. Okay, any, any questions before I sort of try? I have an observation. Yeah. It seems to me that a lot of the things that you've said, I really what, wonder what the answers would be if you applied it to an orchestra, a big orchestra. Uh huh. Yeah. Because you've got age you've got kind of different things and I know for example that the Toronto Symphony which is you know underwater by all kinds of dollars I suspect they'll start to be terminating people yeah yeah I've actually thought of, as a retirement project a great novel would be writing a, a social history of the, of the orchestra from, from the perspective of the fifth violin uh, sitting in the very back um, well because they would have health problems with but you know, I think we're also seeing this. I mean, we're seeing this right now play out at, at the city level, right? As, as QP negotiates new contracts and, and, they're, and, they're, and they're eroding the kind of securities that, that they have. It, it plays out at the university, I think. You know, between uh, uh, you know faculty who are not who are no longer making the kind of income that used to make 25 years ago. Yeah. Also, we see that uh, the military are sending people who are 55 who are in senior positions out on the street too. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. Um, you have about, what, 8% items in the security index. Uh, if you look at whether a subset of those items really are the most associated. Yeah, I'm going to end with, I have exactly a, <laughs> you, you predicted where I was going, so perfect. <laughs> Okay. Okay. So, uh, so I, I think what uh, at least what, what I see here is that the, the index, the way we've designed it, um, is 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 somewhat useful for getting a handle on on what's going on uh, and how precarious employment affects health. So now I think the question is, um, can we can we delineate more clearly what exactly is it about precarious employment that is is driving some of these outcomes? Okay. So uh, this uh, chart is, is very simply. This is this is. Uh, Ten separate regressions. Um, uh, each of them had uh, it looked at, uh, in this case, uh, health, uh, general health less than very good, uh, corrected for age, education, uh, race, uh, gender, etc. And then we threw in one of our uh, index questions. So there's ten questions. We threw in one of them to try and get a sense: of, is is one of the index questions is it more relevant than than another one? And I have to admit, this really surprised me. Uh, quite a bit. So again, this is if you're in a standard employment relationship. So if you told us, yeah, I have a permanent job, one employer, I have benefits, I expect to have that job in a year. Well, your health 
general, your general health is better uh, than if you're not in that situation. And then as we move along, I guess what surprised me here is, is the weakness of, 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 of if you're paid in cash, in part that's because not very many people are paid in cash, but uh, those who don't have any benefits, those whose income uh, varies, uh, not paid if you miss work, these things are, they're, they're not, they weren't the most important. I thought that kind of economic insecurity would be far and away the most important linkage between precarious employment and health, uh, but in fact, it's not the case. The most important one is, is our, our, our workplace health and safety uh, question. Uh, can you raise a health and safety issue without jeopardizing your employment? Right? And the thesis here is if you're an, on a contract worker or you're a temporary worker, you just don't put your hand up and say, excuse me, my job is killing me because your job won't be killing you anymore because you won't have a job. Uh, and, and so that, that came out the strongest and quite significant uh, on, on our scale. And likewise, not knowing your schedule. So, you know, I guess my feeling would have been, look at no income, I don't know what my income, no benefits, don't know what my income is going to be, would be way more important than not knowing my schedule. I can cope with not knowing my, with my schedule. But it seems that the, the not knowing the schedule, uh, not being able to raise your hand and say my work is, 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 is bad for my health uh, uh, is, uh, is driving this, at least on the, on the general health question. And I found that really quite, quite surprising. On the mental health, again, a very kind of similar picture, right? So uh, odds of, of your mental health being less than, than very good. And again, the most significant, the strongest correlation was it between uh, uh, whether you can put your hand up uh, or not and, and, and raise the health and issue. Now, whether each of these is proxy for some bundle of things, I think is a, is a question. I think that's uh, an issue for someone else to take on uh, who, who enjoys these kind of, uh, this kind of more complex analysis more than I am. But I think it does raise some question and it points to some possibilities of how, uh, how you might use this data to look at bundles of factors that are related to, uh, to health outcomes. Um, my own interest, so and I'll finish up with the last couple slides here, is to look more, more carefully at, at, at the relationship between precarity, family, community, and health. Um, and, and here, this is, this is uh, uh, one of the charts from our, our, our report, and this looks at the, the relationship between being in these different uh, security categories, from secure to precarious, and a question to ask, we asked them, anxiety about, does the anxiety about employment interfere with your personal or family life? And what's very clear is that those folks who are in precarious employment, not surprising, are saying, yeah, there is, there is, there is a link. It, 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 it makes me anxious. I don't know if I'm going to have employment. I don't know what my rate of pay is going to be. I don't know if I can pay for my kids to go to camp, etc. Uh, and and it's, it's very strong in, in the precarious group compared to in, 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 in the secure group. So there, there's clearly a different family, uh, a transmission mechanism to the family um, that uh, comes from these different forms uh, of employment. On the social side, this is a question, uh, do you have friends at work who might be a source of support uh, 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 and, and helping them? Again, the, the argument here is, look, if you don't have a permanent workplace, if you're <coughs> a contract here, six months here, two weeks there, uh, you don't develop a group of, of, of workers who are your friends, who you could call on in an emergency, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And again, what we see is that those folks in precarious employment are much, much less likely to say, yeah, I've got a friend at work who I could call on uh, for support. So there's, there's, there's more anxiety in the household. There is less support, less friendship at the workplace, strongly correlated with the form of the employment relationship. And so the question is, can we throw all this together now and, and see if, if, again, if we can make some predictions in what the transmission mechanism uh, might be? So again, this is, we, we, this is a, a logistic regression. We're controlling for age, sex, race, and education. We've got our four categories of, uh, of uh, employment security. We've got our three income categories. And now I've thrown in support at work and anxiety affects family. And what really, uh, and this is one, uh, the general health question, what really jumps out is that those people who say they have poor general health are also those people who say, my employment is creating anxiety at home. And so, potentially, the transmission mechanism, at least in the employment relationship, is not what's going on at work, it's how what's going on at work is affecting what's going on at the household. Support at work not, uh, did, not, did not come out uh, as significant, uh, again, maybe suggesting that there are other mechanisms by which workers in precarious employment can build support, either through community, religion, neighborhood, 
a family, uh, etc. cetera. Uh, and this is the, the, the mental health question. Uh, and here the, the results are, are a little bit different. Again, when you throw in these things, the, the, the employment relationship itself drops out as being significant. Income, poverty still matters a lot. But now what matters is if you have support at work, you're less likely to have mental health problems. And I think intuitively that makes a whole lot of sense. But likewise, if your employment is creating anxiety at home, uh, you're more likely to have mental health problems. So I guess you know, where I end is sort of a, a, a suggestion that, that potentially the transmission mechanism of employment and work is a bit different than we've been thinking about in the past. I think in the past, we've always thought about the workplace as exposure to toxins, um, ex exposure to physical illnesses, et cetera, being harassed and whatnot. Well, maybe the real problem now is that the, the, the transmission to health is actually from support uh, and through family uh, in a very different way. And I think that has sort of some policy implications that we may want uh, to think about. So what are the conclusions? I think one is that, uh, first one, the form of the employment relationship is a very crude measure uh, of employment precarity. Uh, and so when, uh, when, when I'm seeing folks, to be frank, come after me uh, who are using the Stats Canada data, I guess my response is, well, you're not measuring the right thing. Uh, and, and what you're measuring is actually quite inaccurate in terms of what's really going on uh, in the economy. Because I just find it not possible to accept that somehow the workplace is different, the, the <laughs> labor market is different today than it was uh, 30 or 40 years ago. It just looks different uh, uh, every time you, you, have, you have a look at it. Uh, secondly, uh, precarious employment affects general health and especially mental health, but the transmission mechanism is probably through the household and through community uh, rather than through uh, at, at the workplace uh, itself. And that people are interacting with their families and they're interacting with their communities in a different way because of the, uh, uh, of the, of the precarious employment and the situation that they're in. And so the leading factors affecting health include lack of control over work schedule, uh, uh, unstable work hours, inability to exercise a voice at work. These seem to be the things that are driving uh, the health uh, with precarious employment and not things like uh, income insecurity, lack of benefits, et cetera. And of course, the last, the potential pathways to poor health are through the household and through social isolation. And I'll stop there.